Lucarelli coming to you live from my living room. I want to thank everyone for staying in, being socially responsible, washing our hands, and helping flatten the curve. Today we're going to be talking about Red Code Raw, and Red Code Raw is Red's is essentially a form of visually lossless form of wavelet compression that does allow us to essentially have smaller raw files that are greater in image quality and all at resolutions that no other camera can touch. So when we talk about Red Code Raw, and I know I said raw, and then I said compression, but I'm not trying to be an oxymoron. Really, Red Code is what allows us to essentially have data rates that are manageable, that work for our production, and all giving us something that achieves a look or a desired output, all with what we're currently using here. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And before I get into it, I do want to point out that I do have a DSMC Monstro to my right, and I'm also pointing to a DSMC2 Gemini that is shooting me live. So if anyone has any questions about the in-camera settings, we'll handle those at the end, but do know I do have a camera here and I do have that same red ST4 LUT that's applied on here. So when we start talking about achieving that look, just know that you can bring that look into camera and we can also go ahead and generate that right, um, right from initial capture. So let's go ahead and dive right into it because I do try and keep these to about 30 minutes or less. So as we navigate over to my desktop, what we all should see is the current Power of Red campaign that's on red.com. Right? Power of red, R, three R's, should be pretty easy to remember. And if you don't recall, last week we talked about resolution. This week we're going to talk about red code raw. And in a future stream, we'll go ahead and talk about reliability. Now, I already mentioned that red code is red's form of visually lossless wavelet based compression. And what you're essentially seeing here is a red code compression test. We're going to build one of these a little bit later in the stream. But essentially, what you're seeing is our least compressed at five to one. And then 10 to 1 would be twice as compressed as 5 to 1. And then 20 to 1 would be twice as compressed as 10 to 1. What does this all mean? It allows us to essentially have, quarter, or potentially manage our data rates all while still having 16-bit RAW. And I hear you guys. Someone's still going to ask for uncompressed RAW. And I've got a really good visual for any time someone wants to see uncompressed RAW. And we've been able to do it. Just know that uncompressed RAW it can lead to unmanageable data sizes, right? 8K uncompressed is 5,000 megabytes per second. And if we're using a 480 gigabyte card here, you're gonna fill that up every two minutes. I don't know very many productions that'll be happy with changing out a terabyte worth of data every four minutes. Now, if you're doing visual effects or maybe you're doing a big budget studio piece, feel free to shoot five to one, but just notice at our max data rate, that's still only 260 megabytes per second and you're gonna have close to 32 minutes with your 480 card, or maybe you wanna shoot that Netflix sweet spot of eight to one, and notice that we're gonna have up to 50 minutes on that 460 gigabyte, 480 gigabyte card. Now, if I navigate back here to red.com, you'll also see that, yep, 
There are some customers and there are some other manufacturers that do do uncompressed raw, but back to that file size and that data rate, remember, here's my helium, here's my Monstro sensor. It does not matter which one of the sensors you're using. Notice that if I do that 10 to one, which is kind of that middle of the row compression, my data rate's 130 megabytes per second. Maybe we wanna do something closer to that Netflix sweet spot. That's only 162 megabytes per second. Mind you, both of these are 8K, both of these are 16-bit raw, and notice that if we maybe wanna come all the way down to five to one, I'm still only 260 megabytes per second, which is less than what those other cameras are doing at four or 3.4K. And I do gotta point out that I'm doing 8K or 35 megapixels. 4K is right around eight megapixels, so I don't know anyone that's happy doing one-fourth the resolution and having twice the data size. After we talk about red code compression, I do wanna show a little bit of raw versus ProRes, and it's not necessarily just versus, it has to deal with what your system is, what currently your workflow is, maybe you don't have any of the new hardware or advancements that we've been working with and talking about with NVIDIA or perhaps the new metal releases, but just notice the image on the left is 16-bit raw with with uh, with all of those all of those stops of dynamic range, you're gonna have all of that bit depth here that you're seeing in the raw. And over here, by definition, this is not raw. This is ProRes. Notice that when you look at the sky, you might see some of that posterization, or maybe on the surfer's back, John John's back, you can kind of see that blocky artifacts that some other compressions can leave behind. Notice I'm not seeing that on the 16-bit red code raw over here. And we'll talk a little bit more about both red code versus ProRes, because once again, ProRes is a great, great proxy file. And if you want to, you can actually circle back to Red's YouTube page, which you're already on. And my associate, Jonathan Petz, just did a wonderful workflow all on how you could do prox work with proxies. Today, we're going to focus on working with red code raw. So let's go ahead and dive a little bit more into it. After we talk about achieving our look, after we talk about red code and difference between red code and ProRes, we want to talk about achieving that look, getting something that is completely non-destructive. And right here on red.com, you can download this red creative 3D LUT pack. And what this essentially allows us to do is say, hey, we are going for more of a fashion shoot. Maybe we want some more violets in our shadows, or you know what, I'm going for more of a traditional kind of ST4 looking look, and this is the same LUT that I have in my camera. Or maybe we wanna do something more stylized like Clerks goes to the ballet here. Notice that none of this is destructive. You can download it right here from red.com or perhaps you just wanted to come over here to the downloads page and you can download the LUTs. They're right here at the bottom of the page and this will have both the creative and the technical LUTs as well. If uh, anyone wanted to participate and, 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 and try some of this in your NLE at home, notice that right here on red.com under the learn section, you can navigate to the sample R3D page and notice we have multiple versions of multiple sensors on here. You're gonna see some from our full frame Monstro sensor, some from our 8K Super 35 sensor, and notice some are at 10 to one, some are close to five to one at four to one, and really you shouldn't notice much difference from four to one to five to one or one red code compression difference, but really feel free to download these and try and participate as we go along. I don't see any here on 20 to one, but I'm not advocating shooting 20 to one right out of the bat. I just wanna show you that you can download some files and essentially play with us at home. I do also wanna encourage you all to notice when I talk about data rates and file sizes that this is the red.com recording calculator. We actually make this in an app as well. But if you come back here to the learn section, you can navigate to the red tools. And really this is just doubling up what I already showed you. If we're shooting 8K with our Monstro or Helium, notice it didn't change anything on our data rate. If I select five to one, that's 260 megabytes per second. And really you're gonna fill up your half a terabyte card on the half hour or pretty much a terabyte an hour. That's great for big budget or studios or VFX shoots, but maybe we wanna ball on a budget and shoot 8K at 20 to one because we're not going to something like that. Notice that at 20 to one, which I'm not advocating shooting right out of the bat, Notice that I changed my data rate considerably. I'm about one fourth the size, and I'm now recording close over two hours when just a second ago, we were only at a half hour. So that's the flexibility that Red Code's gonna allow us to do. And really, I'm gonna show you some real time examples of how you can find that sweet spot. Now you could always take our word for it, or if you did wanna go ahead and navigate to something completely neutral, you can type in Netflix's approved cameras or see the link at the bottom of the page. And what you'll see is a couple other cameras from the other manufacturers here. 
and if you scroll on down you'll see it pretty much every red camera we've ever made is accepted and notice over here on the red code section they're all at eight to one six to one none of them are all the way down to five to one so essentially at the end of the stream maybe we can go ahead and play around with red code and learn that compression doesn't have to be that blocky chunky uh, nasty thing that we try and avoid now I've mentioned red code, but maybe you were really interested about learning about ISO, and I've came here to red.com support page, and notice I type three letters, and I get a number of articles and red.com red learn sections in case you wanted to learn a little bit more about ISO, or maybe you heard me and Johnny talk about IPP2 and you don't really know what that means. So notice I type in four letters, I've got four different articles here, and I can essentially come back in and learn at my own pace. And maybe all these uh, acronyms are gobbledygook to you and you just don't even know what we're talking about, just notice you can always click this help section and start up a conversation with one of our sales associates at any time and it's a great way to go ahead and learn at your own pace. Now I don't want to waste everyone's time, I try and keep this to around 30 minutes or less, so let's go ahead and navigate over into Red Cine X first for my very own DIY red code compression test. Now, I was unable to hire any talent to come over to my house, so what you're essentially looking at is three shots. It's my little boho beach ball. And notice that I've cleaned up the metadata section, so you're only seeing resolution, red code, and sensor. Notice the first one's at five to one, the second one's at 10 to one, and the last one's at 20 to one. And you may have seen a slight image shift there, but notice what I'm doing here. This is 65 megabytes per second. This is 130 megabytes per second. This is 260. I'm not seeing a whole heck of a lot of detail shift. And really, if we go down two clicks, one, two, I want to be on the third one. Oh, one more time. So this is the most compressed file. You can see that right here. This is clip three. And let's zoom in to something ridiculous like 400%, which no editor would ever advocate going into. And notice we're at 400%. And I'll go ahead and click play here. And yes, with red code compression, you should see a softening of maybe some edge detail here. Maybe you're gonna notice a little bit of movement of in, in the schmutz of this coral. But once again, I'm at 400%, and this is a file that's less than 70 megabytes per second here. If I look at this at 100%, is anyone noticing that softening of the edge, or maybe that little bit of dancing that was going on in that coral? No, because there's not a whole lot of movement here. This is essentially my talking heads interview. And if I don't have a whole lot of overlapping patterns in detail, then you can go ahead and get away with a lot of compression. Now notice this is a terabyte every, every four hours. This is a terabyte of, of recording every two hours. Or let me go up to the five to one. This is a terabyte on the hour. I'm not seeing four times the difference here, are you? Nope. And you shouldn't because this doesn't have a whole lot of movement here and it's probably not the best red code compression test but really doing my best social distancing this is what i had readily available now notice we could go to something like this which is a downtown china uh, time lapse here and there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of overlapping imagery here and if i go ahead and look at this at 100 percent what you can essentially see is this is the five to one and if this looks familiar this is the same video that was at the beginning of the class and notice as I click down, two clicks, one, two, we're now on the most compressed file, and you should have seen an image shift, right? Yes, it did get a little bit darker there, but honestly, anyone that's done time lapse knows, hey, clouds go away and clouds come back. And if I did want to match all three of these 8K completely raw, 16-bit raw clips, look at this. I have red code, best look here. See all three of these clips? I'm going to go ahead and apply it to all three clips. And sure enough, I just went ahead and did a base light or initial color correction on all three clips. And now if I go ahead and look at them, they're not going to have that much of a difference between them. Now, once again, at 100% or at full res, I'm not seeing that much of a detail loss. But let's go ahead and do that same zoom in. And maybe we look at some things like trees in the wind or high frequency movement like these people over here or maybe these cars, and I just want to point out, this is 20 to 1. I don't know anyone that grabs our camera and then automatically gravitates to the 20 to 1. Now, mind you, this is 20 to 1, or a terabyte every four hours. If I go up one click, this is 10 to 1. Looks a little bit cleaner. And if I go up one more click, that is 5 to 1, right? Now, 5 to 1 is great if we're doing studio effects, right? and I need to take this tree and turn it into a dinosaur that's climbing up this building, but really, if we're not doing that, 
I'm not really seeing the between the 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1. And once again, you notice that at full resolution. Now, where would you notice that? I'm going to go ahead and come out of full frame and navigate over here into Red Cine, or not into Red Cine X, yeah, into Adobe Premiere. And a little bit of a cooking show here. I've already went ahead and built the 4K sequence. And if anyone wants to see how I built this sequence, just notice that I did that in a previous solitary series. I'm not trying to be redundant and show you the same thing twice. You could always navigate back to, Red, uh, to Red's YouTube page and you can see that we have all of the solitary series right here. And this is the one where I show you how you can go ahead and bring in your clips into Adobe Premiere. Now notice what I built right here. This is your very first Red Code compression test. If it looks familiar, it's the same one that was looping at the beginning of the class. Notice that the red clips are the 5 to 1, the green clips are the 10 to 1, and the blue clips are the 20 to 1. I essentially led with the, with the highest quality clip, and then did the side by side by side, and then also did the 100% punch in to kind of replicate what a 4K clip would look at, what that 4K punch in would look in on my 8K shot. And if I do want to go full frame here, you'll see this at the end, but really you shouldn't notice much difference here, only slightly. Now the reason I did this is a great way for anyone at home, maybe you have that producer, that VFX artist, someone that swears that they have to shoot the lowest compression, do one of these red code tests where you essentially shoot 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, bring it into your sequence, do a side by side like side like I'm doing right here, and essentially let their eyes be the judge. If they can't tell the difference between 10 to 1 and 5 to 1, then maybe you go ahead and shoot 5 to 1 and you just cut your media budget in half. That's pretty flexible there. And really, if you're only seeing a slight change, then that's definitely something that I would recommend going ahead and doing. Now, anytime we talk about red code, I commonly get asked, well, what is the sweet spot? What is the sweet spot? And really, if you want to know what the sweet spot is, it depends on what your deliverable is. Here's a really, really good red code compression test. It was done by John Marchant. He's one of our Red Army associates. And notice that if I show this to anyone, or you guys are probably looking at this at home, you're probably leaning in really close or zooming in. And really, I find my VFX artists and my DPs loving the five to one. And I find my editors, my producers, anyone that actually has to buy the hard drive saying, eh, we like the 20 to one. Now, really, I'm not saying shoot the least compressed and I'm not saying shoot the most compressed. What I'm saying is find your sweet spot. Now, big budget features, right? Like if I need to go in here and paint superhuman battle armor on her because she's fighting off the galactic aliens that are coming in, yeah, shoot five to one. Or maybe I need to go paint hobbit fur on her or uh, gills because she's swimming underwater, then sure, shoot five to one. But really, notice right here, web TV, streaming TV, six to one. I just showed you Netflix will accept up to eight to one depending on what sensor you're shooting. And notice we have features going anywhere from 6 to 10 to 1. So really what we're saying here is that red code does not have to be something that we steer away from. It actually can be something that we embrace and use it to help maximize our workflow. Now I also want to point out that there's a 4K compression uh, test down here. And really I'm trying to save you some time. You don't need to do an 8K test and a 7K test and a 6K test and a 5K test. Why? because higher resolution cameras can typically get away with higher red code ratios. What do I mean by that? We'll learn a little bit more about that in the class, but essentially, if you're going from 8K to 6K, you can get away with about three to four more red code compression jumps. And the reason for that is, it's pretty apparent to see is if I come back over here, 8K versus 6K, and notice I have the resolution equivalent right here. 8K is about 35 megapixels, 6K is about 19 megapixels. So as you can see here, it's not 2K or two megapixels plus 4K, eight megapixels equals 6K. It does not. So really when we're talking about shooting with extra resolution, you can get away with more compression. And I have a really, really good real-time story for this. And all you have to do is come back to that red.com uh, recording calculator. And I was working with a studio, and I won't say the studio's name, but they had a really great production. They shot everything at five to one, and they won a bunch of awards. And I came in there, and they said, James, we love your last camera. We shot everything at five to one, and our data rate, well, they didn't really know their data rate, but they knew what they shot. And their production was happy because they were changing out their cards every hour. Now I come in with my 8K camera and skulls on my shirts, and I literally hear one of the producers go, Gigabytes is here, get your hard drives ready, and I get it. 
right? 8K is bigger than four, but really if I come down here and I change this sensor to either my Monstro or my Helium, it does not matter. Yes, my data rate did change there to 260, but you're also shooting five to one when a second ago we were shooting only 19 megapixels. At 8K, we're shooting 35 megapixels, so maybe we get away with one, two, three, four more red code compression jumps. And look what I did here. I just changed our data rate to 144 megabytes per second, which is essentially one megabyte bigger than we were a second ago. And notice my record time is exactly the same. So really, with more resolution, you can get away with more red code compression, and that's what we're gonna go ahead and show you here in class. Essentially, five to one's great for your visual effects, visually lossless stuff. Eight to one, 10 to one's a good sweet spot for 4K streaming, or maybe 12 to one, 14 to one if it's something that's a little bit less than that. All right, I'm gonna open up Red Cine X in the background here because it looked like it dropped on me. And we're gonna move over into the second portion of this, which is the red code versus ProRes. Now, I, once again, I'm not saying red code versus ProRes because once again, all of our cameras can shoot ProRes and it's a great, great proxy if you wanna use it as a proxy and maybe even a finishing file. But notice that this is the same red raw clip and notice that this clip is brighter than this one. And if I click on the effects tab and I look at the controls, I can clearly see that this clip has been sped up and slowed down using frame interpolation. And really, as I look at it, it goes slow motion, and then back to fast, and then this one's all slow-mo. What essentially I'm showing you here is I have two raw clips already in my sequence, 16-bit raw, 120 frames per second, and if I need this clip to match this clip, all I essentially have to do is click on this clip, come over here to the effects tab, come over here to the raw tab, and if you notice here, I have all the raw camera controls that I would have in any of my color creating programs. I can change the color space, the gamma space, the ISO, all of the CDL, slope, power, saturation, all of that can be changed on a fly, non-destructive, because this is raw. Now, I want this shot to match this one, so I'm gonna take it from an ISO 500 to 1000, that's one stop, from 1000 to 2000, and what you're gonna see here is I just very quickly color matched both of my two shots here, and I would not have been able to do that had I been working with a proxy. I would not have been able to change that nearly as quick. And really, I showed you a real quick way that you could go ahead and match both of your clips. Now, I do own one of these cameras, and I do continually get told that, hey, if you want your paycheck, Mr. Red Owner, you're gonna have to go ahead and give me some ProRes. But before I go ahead and do that, let me go ahead and look at this file a little bit deeper. So if I right click on it, Revo Reveal and Explore, what essentially I'm gonna see here is that this is the inside of a red clip. Notice that there is the R3D, which is the actual RAW, and it's about 2.42 gigs. There is the RMD, which is the metadata. And then there's these sidecar 3D LUT files that are completely non-destructive, and notice they don't ever touch the RAW and they don't ever touch the metadata. And if I come back one clip, or one, one folder, notice that this is how a red digital clip looks as it comes off the mag. I can tell that this was from camera C, card 22, clip 12, and this was originally shot on March 14th. So all useful information, especially when I wanna come in here and say, hey, sh tell me, excuse me, tell me a little bit more about this clip. Now notice this is the 16-bit raw clip, and if I move this over here, this is 2.42 gigs, and I'm pretty sure that no one's gonna be no one's gonna be surprised that my 4K video file is around 2.42 gigs. That's a decent size for a video file, but, when I compare that to the ProRes clips that I actually already exported here, notice I did a 2K and a 4K quad four version, and I already uh, did a nice little screenshot here for my Mac so everyone can see it a little bit better. But notice this is the 16-bit RAW clip. This is the 2K and 4K ProRes equivalent. Notice it's the same file name. Notice they're all the same length. And really, this is the quad four 2K and this is the quad four 4K. If you notice the raw file is about the same size as the 2K Quad 4 ProRes, so showing me some flexibility there. And then also if I look at that compared to the 4K Quad 4 ProRes, notice that that Quad 4 ProRes is almost 10 gigs where the raw file was only a little over two. Now, once again, I wanna earn my paycheck, so let me go back over here into Premiere and you said we gotta work with the ProRes, so you got it, Mr. Client. I'm gonna take your 2K and 4K ProRes, bring them right here into my sequence, and let's go ahead and look at that file that you told me was pretty much the same size. There's my in, 
There's my out. And I'm going to drop this nice little nose pick 360 by John John Florenson. And the one thing we're going to go ahead and see here is that, eh, yeah, that 2K ProRes file that you told me was pretty much the same size, it does not fit in my 4K sequence. And I don't think any of my editors are going to like it if I come up here and set the frame size and scale this up by 200%. So let's go ahead and blow out this 2K ProRes file because it does not work for my sequence. Now here's the 4K ProRes file. And notice that if I come over here and do the same in and the same out, yes, I can bring this clip into my sequence. And yes, I do have a little bit of black bars here. So I can just come in here to the effects tab and maybe increase it by about 10%. And yes, that did clean up my 4K ProRes file. And yes, that does fit in the sequence right next to my RAW. But what are we noticing here, guys and gals? Yeah, your ProRes clip that you just exported out that's three times the size of my RAW, you need to get with the RAW guys because you're not on point with the new color correction. Well, I could click on the clip and then come over here to the effects tab and come over here to the master control and yeah, you don't have that same RAW control. You cannot change the ISO, white balance, color temperature, gamma space. All of that information is not here because this is not a RAW clip. So really, I don't know anyone that wants to work with a file that's two, three times the size that doesn't have nearly a lot, much elasticity. So let's go ahead and blast this clip out. And Red Cine X just opened up in my background here and I'm an Apple S no stress guy. So notice I just opened that back up, say okay. And the reason I wanted to come back here really quick is notice that this is that same John John Florence shot that we're looking at right here. And if I come over here to my image, notice that I already came in here and created a bunch of preset looks for this class, right? There's this red code best look. Yep, that gets me back to the look that I was going for. And then notice that I also came in here and created some looks that were based off of that that either have a LUT or maybe have a LUT plus one or two stops. So notice that if I had more clips here, I could quickly go ahead and apply this to both clips. And notice that I just added color correction. I added a 3D LUT. And if I come down here to the 3D LUT manager, I could clearly see, hey, maybe what does that black and white look version look like, right? This is a very quick, non-destructive way that you can go ahead and add multiple 3D LUTs to multiple clips and then bring that over into Premiere and essentially have, or your NLE of choice, and have that look have an initial grade or maybe that 3D LUT that we didn't have previously. But maybe your sequence is already built, right? I pretty much have this whole 45 second edit done. I have my red code compression test at the beginning. I've got my raw versus ProRes clips right here. And we're now gonna go into the creative 3D LUT section of this where I have the same clip brought in multiple times. And notice that I did not apply, I did not apply any LUTs on the clip level, right? You could click on the clip, come over here to the effects tab, come over here to the master tab, and notice that I could come down here and there's no 3D LUT selected, but I could browse and find one here on my desktop. To me, this is a little clunky and chunky having to touch every clip. So really, I don't advocate putting in the 3D LUT on this way. What I would rather do is lock your sequence, get all of your in and outs, get all of your speed ramps and, and things like that that you wanna have in here, and then navigate over to the Lumetri tab. Now notice once I'm in Lumetri, I can clearly see the original source file right here, as well as the clip that I'm currently on. And as I move my mouse over here, I can clearly see what 3D LUT that I've applied to that clip. It's also very easy for me to come down here and try the fluorescent LUT, and I've just changed it. Or maybe I just use these little sliders here to try the, the grime LUT. Notice that I'm applying these LUTs or lookup tables. They are completely non-destructive. And really, if I wanted to, I kind of did the same little wipe so you could pause it mid-grade and go ahead and see what you like do we like the grime or do we like the super color nope we want to go back to the grime pretty cool way that you can essentially apply 3d LUTs all of this is non-destructive and really as I scroll through my multiple clips here I'm doing that all with an 8k file 16-bit raw at red code 5 to 1 with my my existing NLE sequence so I'm trying to show you guys here in real time that it's pretty easy to say, nope, we don't like the super color LUT. Let's go ahead and try that ST4 LUT. And sure enough, I'm seeing that change happen right here. Pretty cool to see that we're applying all of these looks, all to raw clips, and none of this is destructive. So if I went over here and marked an out, and I came back over here and marked an in, 
That is essentially my 45 second sequence that has multiple 8K clips, multiple 4K speed ramps in here, various 3D LUTs applied, and really if I went ahead and exported this, it took me about six minutes to do that right before the stream started. Now, I'm not gonna go ahead and, and do that here because it does kill the stream, but I am gonna go ahead and move myself up into top upper left so you can see that I'm still here. Hey, how you doing? And I am gonna go ahead and show you what this export looks like. At first, you should see the red code compression test, right, where there's five to one, 10 to one, 20 to one. Notice that you should only see a slight shift there, but that's pretty impressive considering I'm having and doubling and quartering my data rates with each one of those red code compression jumps. Then you're gonna see multiple versions of the 4K John John Florence and Eric Knuston high frame rate shot where I've either sped it up or slowed it down, brought it up a stop, brought it down a stop, and all of that is non-destructive because we are working with the red code raw. And lastly, you're gonna go ahead and see the multiple versions where I've applied 3D LUTs. I did that all within my sequence. None of that was destructive. And really, if you don't like my look, we could remove it at any time. Pretty cool stuff. I'm gonna let that continue to play for just a second here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and navigate back to my uh, camera in full. And I'm gonna look over and see if anyone has any questions here. And I do wanna point out that I do have a camera to my right. And if we do wanna have any camera questions, I can go ahead and show you that as well. Perfect. All right, great question. Uh, common, common question that comes up when I'm trying to ball on a budget or manage my data rate, a common thing to do is go down in resolution rather than go, down, go up in compression. And really that's the wrong thing to do. Red code loves resolution. The, the algorithm actually likes to have all of that extra resolution so it can go ahead and, and tell what actually you are shooting. And if you notice over my right or better yet, I'm gonna actually navigate here to my camera menu so you can actually see what I'm seeing here live, what you should see is me in the upper left and my camera over here live, and it does look like that may have stalled out just a bit, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my camera live while I go ahead and navigate back to that. And if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna look over to my left. Can I work proxy in Adobe Premiere and do my edit with raw footage and resolve? Yeah, Sean, great question. You can definitely do that. What you would essentially do is when you're coming back to the export, you would wanna make sure that you, ex you export out that uh, XML and that is the, essentially the cut list that allows you to bring that over into your NLE and have multiple programs work and round trip it. And really for what you're asking, you really should come back to uh, right here to Jonathan Pett's proxy workflow and he covered essentially that. He started in Resolve, went into Premiere, and then round-tripped it back over. Great question. Boba Fett, yeah. Great question, all right. Let me see if I can go ahead and take it back to camera. All right. Perfect. All right, well thank you everyone for doing those great questions. I did wanna point out if anyone noticed I am shooting five to one, and the camera is telling me, hey, it's, it's yellow right now. A little, a little pro tip right there. Essentially what you're seeing is, uh, we all know that famous rockumentary where they like to crank it to 11. Uh, what I'm showing you right there, a little pro tip from Phil Holland. We love you, Phil. Uh, I lovingly call that the Holland tap. Essentially, I've told the camera to shoot two to one, which the camera can't do. And so when it's yellow like that, the camera is telling me, hey, I can't do two to one, I'll give you five to one. So notice that if I go to five to one, that is no longer yellow, but I do wanna point out, we only have 26 minutes of recording time. Now I'm not doing a visual effects shoot, and really if I look behind me here, this is pretty much just a talking heads interview. I don't have a whole lot of movement going on behind me. Maybe I don't need to shoot five to one. Maybe I shoot, I don't know, something not quite 20 to one, but maybe I shoot, I don't know, something like 14 to one. Now why 14 to one at 8K? It's a great modest place to start. It's right around less than 100 megabytes per second. And if you notice, I'm gonna go ahead and magnify in on Mando, not Boba Fett, Mandalorian over here. And notice that I'm at 14 to one, less than 100 megabytes per second. And if I go ahead and rack, 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 
I can see all that detail on that Vespar body armor, and none of that is 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 it is lost or blocky or chunky, right? Now, there's not a whole lot of movement there, so that's probably not the best example. So let's go ahead and magnify back out. And you do have to magnify back out. You can't move that cursor when you are in magnify, but maybe I magnify over and split the difference and kind of go over here in this little area. And what you're essentially gonna see is some little blobby blobs at first, but notice, do a quick little rack. There is my second sister, right? And she's looking right at camera. And then if I go over to uh, my dog, Hallie, sleeping on the couch, I can clearly see that I'm in trouble because uh, she's not supposed to be over there and I can see hair fibers in the couch. And then notice over there at the fireplace. That fireplace is high frequency detail and I'm not seeing a whole lot of macro blocking loss of image or any real shift here. And once again, this is less than 100 megabytes per second. If I, ha if I magnify back out, notice that we're still shooting 8K. And if anyone's curious of what these frame guides are, I just went ahead and showed that I have a 6.5K, a, a 6K, and a 4.5K resolution, all well within my 8K resolution. And mind you, my file size is much, much smaller than a lot of those other camera manufacturers. And, and, and I'm seeing a lot of questions still coming through on what's the best thing to do, resolution or red code, which one do I, panel, which one do I change first? And I wanna navigate to my desktop here and show you a really good image, it's a telltale image, and it's also from that same John Marchant shoot. And really, what we're looking at here is that same shot, 8K, 4K, 2K. Now, maybe we love this shot, but then I look at it a little bit closer and, and I didn't realize that that pole was growing out of her head. If I need to come in here and lasso tool out that pole, which one would I rather use? The 8K shot, the 4K shot, or this 2K one that kind of looks like a little smudgy thumbprint? I would much rather work with the 8K, why? Because 8K will allow things to look more round. It'll allow you to essentially have more clarity. It'll allow you to have better detail and even less noise. So in conclusion, Red code is the one thing that lets us manage our file size to essentially be at a data rate that we're consistent or comfortable with and still retain all of that high, high image quality, right? We're doing 16-bit RAW. A lot of those other camera manufacturers are doing 8 or 10-bit RAW. And really, if I did want to go ahead and see what that looks like, just know that not all RAW is created equally. And this is a great example of that. Here's red at 16-bit RAW. I don't care what red code compression you shoot it at. Here is the equivalent with 8-bit, right? Notice that blocky posterization. And if you wanted to see what the math looks like behind this, here's 16-bit raw or 281 trillion possible tones versus that 12-bit, 10-bit, 8-bit. I don't know about y'all, but I would much rather shoot with the 16-bit raw than any of these other chunky, clunky uh, compressions. Now, one other thing I like to point out here if you look at the Netflix page, right, you can see our Gemini, which is our most recent sensor. I can also see that they're accepting at 5K at 8 to 1. 5K at 8 to 1, if I come back over here to my recording time calculator, notice that if I change this to the Gemini and I take this down to 8 to 1, look what happened to my data rate. I'm at 70 megabytes per second. I'm shooting all within that high, high quality Netflix level accept acceptance of raw and notice that my same card that we only had a half hour of recording time with I now have almost two hours so really that is the real benefit of red code essentially allowing us to have a manageable data rate have something that works within our current workflow and all the while not filling up uh, more hard drives than we absolutely need pretty cool stuff I'm gonna take it back to my camera in full and look to my left one last time and see if there's any other questions great question All right, well, load LUTs in camera. Great question. Um, so right now I have the camera in the IPP2 mode or image processing pipeline two. So really as I navigate, I'm gonna apologize, I have to look my head over this way. Notice that I come over here to menu. And let's get my cursor up. And I'm gonna go menu, image, image pipeline. And you can clearly see that I'm in IPP2. And if I want to go down to the 3D LUT section, it's super, super easy. 
you can see this little button over here that says import export. It essentially gives you two windows here. I like to think of this as my finder window. This is what's on the media. This is what's on the camera. I take my red mag, right? My red mag, which I've already loaded 3D LUTs on, and I insert it into camera. And if I have 3D LUTs, they'll show up right here. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and move inversely, if I wanted to move a 3D LUT from the camera to the mag, all I essentially have to do is navigate over to that ST4 LUT that we're using, right? Because this is the show LUT that we're using for the stream. It's on both cameras and you want to use it in your post-production. Watch this. I just hit that little arrow, not the all, but just the single arrow, and now it's essentially on the card. If I eject the card and walk over to the other camera, I can now jam, 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 and insert that same 3D LUT on all the cameras. Now, I do want to point out that a little, another pro tip, if you go back to my 3D LUTs, notice that I have way more 3D LUTs than anyone would ever want to shoot on a given show. I don't recommend having this many 3D LUTs. I'd say probably 20 or less. Uh, it can affect your boot up time if you have too many LUTs and too many 3D presets. I did try and just load as many as I could. And as you can see, that's way more than I would ever want to scroll through. Great question. Yeah, how do you get the LUTs into Premiere? Great, great question. Um, if I come back over here to Premiere, right, I already showed you how you could do it on the clip level, right? Click on the clip, come over here to the Effects tab, come over here to the Raw tab, and I'm gonna go to my desktop because you guys weren't seeing that here. But we're back in Premiere, right? I want to maybe go ahead and add a LUT to this clip right here. If I click on the clip, come over here to the Effects tab, come over here to the Raw tab, I could add a 3D LUT right here, but once again, that's kind of clunky and chunky, and I don't want to have to browse through every single time. So what you can essentially do is, I'm going to come over here to my uh, Explorer. You're going to come to my C drive. I'm going to come to my program files, come into Adobe, right click on this guy and say, open a new window. You're going to come to the Lumetri tab, come to the LUTs tab, come to the Creative tab, and essentially, once you've downloaded the 3D LUTs, download them and then bring them into this folder. And now, once they're here, you won't have to browse every single time. Essentially, your 3D LUTs are now in the, in, in the program files. And notice that if I click on the file, I can now just come over here and select all of those same IPP2 3D LUTs. And maybe we want to make this black and white. And sure enough, it's now black and white. Great question. Great question. Well, I, I'm not seeing a whole heck of a lot of other questions coming in. I believe my associates must have answered them all. I do want to thank everyone for tuning in. I also want to thank everyone that emailed us at Solitary Series at Red. We love the suggestions. We love the follow-ups. If you have anything else, please feel free to send them our way because really, we're in this like you. We're all stuck here in our living rooms trying to make the most of it. And really, hopefully, we're sharing something with you that you're learning from and we can hopefully keep doing this. Great, great. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'm going to try and end this stream, keep it under 40 minutes. We just talked about Red Code RAW, which in conclusion is Red's form of in-camera proprietary RAW recording. It does allow us to shoot essentially smaller RAW files that are higher in image quality, all at resolutions that no other camera manufacturer can touch. And why are we doing this? Because maybe we don't want to just have to buy extra hard drives if we're not doing a VFX shoot. Maybe it's a Talking Heads interview like I am right now, so you don't have to shoot that lowest, lowest compression. Use Red Code to your benefit, and essentially it'll allow you to find a data rate that works for your production. Now, on the way out, I'm going to go ahead and show you the third R, a little bit of a sneak peek at the third R. We talked about Red Code today. We did resolution last week. We're going to cover reliability in an upcoming stream, and you're going to see a great, great testimonial from uh, my favorite skate cinematographer in Ty Evans. He was shooting a film called We Are Blood that was a theatrical release. You can navigate back online and find it anywhere, but you're going to see a really, really cool testimonial of how robust our cameras are. Now, I'm not advocating doing what him and his skater Mikey Taylor did in this shoot, but it is kind of nice to know that when you're wondering if your camera will hold up, these guys beat them up pretty hard, and I'll, I'll, I'll let the video go ahead and speak for itself. But I want to thank everyone again for tuning in. Please feel free to email us, chat us, and tune in on the next one. And thank you so much for tuning in to Red Solitary Series.
Dunzo! Alright, moment of truth. Yeah! Still works! So this is the same camera. One that fell. From the helicopter. 100 foot drop. Still works. Gonna put it on here and just go handheld now. <laughs>